Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and is indeed he is, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So Christ is risen. What a mess. What a mess. What a mess. I mean, you heard the story, right? Uh, Easter Sunday, uh, Mary Magdalene and another Mary who's not, whose name isn't fully given, they come and they discover Jesus. But you turn just the next gospel and it's Mary Magdalene and another woman named Mary and some woman named Salome. That's three, isn't it? And then you turn another gospel and, well, it's just Mary Magdalene. She's the one all alone who first sees Jesus. And then you turn to yet the fourth, another gospel, and and it's not even any of Jesus' close companions who see him first. Rather, it's two men walking on the road to Emmaus. I mean, what a mess. It's Easter Sunday, the most important day of the entire year, and they can't even get the story right? I mean, it kind of makes you wonder, is this whole resurrection thing just another April Fool's joke just a couple of thousand years earlier or what? Some conspiracy on the part of the disciples to concoct something? Well, if so, they're awfully bad conspiracists because, you know, in any conspiracy, you make sure that everybody has the story exactly the same. <laughs> they publish four versions, right? No... Or maybe is this Jesus' April Fool's joke on us? You know, you thought you could keep me down and I would make trouble no more? <laughs> Have I got news for you? April Fool's. Now, if I were a betting person, and I'm not, but if I were, uh, if I had to put money on whether this was just some sort of a hoax or conspiracy or whether this is really Jesus' April Fool's joke on us, I would definitely bank on Jesus um, because I have to. I'm a minister. I mean, you know. <laughs> I don't have to be a minister, and I am because I believe this stuff. No, you know, I put my money on, on resurrection, and here's, here's why. Um, if you think about it, think about how many just normal people uh, will swear they have experienced someone touching them from beyond. You know, a lot of people, we all know, you have this, to talk about having this experience. Well, that's gone on ever since the beginning of human, the human species. In every culture of the world, people have, some have claimed to have been touched by someone from beyond. Now, we could say, well, some people are just kind of wishfully thinking, but all of humanity throughout all of history, if just one of those stories is true, then it's true there is an afterlife. Not only true there is an afterlife, but rather it's true that some people are capable of touching us from beyond that life. Now, some people even claim to have seen visions of people who have, who have passed on. I haven't, but my good friend John Selders, who's the founding pastor of Amistad UCC, it was an experience of a vision of his deceased grandfather, who was a minister, that actually called him into ministry. Now, John's a very intelligent and sane guy. <laughs> And if he was just trying to make a hoax of things, he certainly committed a whole lot to a very difficult career in order to make that claim. I don't know. 
You know, I used to think that, you know, after 25 years of ministry, I constantly will get people who join with me before a funeral. We talk about the family, and people will say that these wild things happen. They, they swear that their loved one has reached out in some way. And I used to think, isn't that nice? I mean, I believed in the afterlife, but I thought, isn't that nice kind of wishful thinking on the part of people who are, who are grieving until my own father passed away a few years ago, and guess what happened? I mean, so many weird coincidences and so forth, and gut intuitions that seemed to have the imprint of my father on it that I could no longer deny that even factoring for my own wishful thinking, there's something here. And, you know, i, I got to tell you something. My father, since he's died, has given me better advice than he ever gave me while I was alive. And why wouldn't that be the case, right? I mean, if, if he has actually touched me, if he's touching me from, a, from an awareness that is so much greater than he ever had on earth, of course. Well, if either my story is correct or anybody's stories are correct, again, there is an afterlife. People are capable of touching other people. And if that's possible for anyone, it is certainly possible, would have been possible for Jesus. <laughs> for Jesus. Especially given the fact that that there were many, many Messianic movements that, that arose uh, in, in and around Jesus' time. And every time the, the, the supposed Messiah was dispatched, the, everybody dispersed. Everybody went into hiding. You never heard about them again. In Jesus' case, every single one of his dis disciples went throughout the entire rest of their lives claiming that Jesus was risen from the dead. And nearly everyone continued to claim that at knife point. They actually preferred death than renounce that belief. Something happened on Easter Sunday. Physical resurrection, a vision, what have you. Something happened to move their souls. And what it did was not only excite them, but it confirmed what Jesus was saying. It confirmed his identity. It confirmed the truth of his basic message. And they got very excited, but I know it's kind of a bad news story, isn't it? Because if Jesus' central message is true, that means we actually have to do this stuff. <laughs> Love our enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Bless those who curse us. And pray for those who mistreat us. We actually have to do that stuff. That's a command from Jesus. And apparently God confirmed that command. So I'm sorry to ruin Easter Sunday for you. But you know, there is some good news to this. That God does not ask of us what God does not also do. In other words, God calls us to love our enemies, but God also loves our enemies, which includes us when we don't do what God says. Right? This central message was confirmed in spades just this week. You remember the story of Holy Week. We were kind of reminded ourselves last week. Jesus knew he was going to die. They were going to catch up with him eventually. They were all, he was on, always kind of weaving in and out, evading the authorities. He knew he, his end was near, so he decided to make it a big one, cast his central message in a way that once it was seen, it could never be unseen again. Once you heard about it, you could never forget it. It happened last Friday on a cross when Jesus puts his own body in place of the Passover lamb on the day of Passover. You remember from last week what Passover was all about, or from previous weeks. You remember that the Passover was when the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost by the, Egyptian, I mean the Israelite slaves so that God's spirit would pass over the, sla the innocent slaves and slaughter the guilty oppressors. But Jesus putting himself in the place of the Passover lamb, it was not the innocent people who were good, God-fearing people who then put the, the blood, you know, shed the blood. It was actually the guiltiest you can get, killing the Messiah. And if this means God is passing over even those who kill the Messiah, well then, who's God going to let God's wrath out on? Apparently nobody. Apparently this God is, is not this self-righteous old man sitting on a throne just watching every move we make, just trying to decide, uh, should they go up or should they go down? This God seems a lot more like a parent. 
like a father or a mother who never gives up on her children. All are in the embrace of God. That is the central core message of God. And that message was confirmed on this day 2,000 years ago. What are the implications of that for you and for me? What are the implications of that for God? From Paul's letters to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. 
and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And from his letter to the Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Before Jesus died, he told his disciples, I am going to my father and yours. My father and yours. He said, I will not, therefore, leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is the major implication of all this life and death and life after death resurrection thing. That if Jesus is who they say he is, that if he is the son of God, and if he is going to his father and yours, that makes you and me, that makes Jesus <laughs> our brother. That also makes you and me sisters and brothers, but that but specifically that means Jesus is our brother. If Jesus is son of God, then you are a daughter or a son of God as well. Nobody got this better, at least from our, in our Bibles, better than Paul. You heard what he had to say in our scriptures just now, but did you get the deep impact of his words? Listen again in Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. Because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In other words, we can already, we don't have to wait even to be adopted. We can already claim our adoption. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. What Jesus gets, you get too, because you are an heir. Paul goes on in, in, in Romans, if people just didn't quite get it, he explains it. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. He repeats that again. Remember, you are no longer a slave. You fall back on fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Of adoption. On and on, using child of God language, using language of adoption. Jesus is our brother. We are sons and daughters of God. We right now are living in a giant orphanage <laughs> and we are about to be adopted. My friend Bruce Van Blair describes the situation quite eloquently this way. He says, why all the alienation? Why is it so hard here? And how come we all seem to know that it is not supposed to be this way? All the pain and suffering, all the people starving, all the cruelty and broken hearts and disillusionment and despair. Not remembering anything before this life, why do we still feel like we came from a better place or know better patterns of life? Why do we so often feel that somehow we are lost or displaced here, somehow that this world is not our home? Why do we sense some inner identity we cannot quite grasp? And how can we recover from this strange amnesia, stop all the curses of separation and find some way to truly repent, that is to turn around and go home? Never forget, writes Bruce, never forget where you are. If somebody does something nice for you, rejoice and be thankful. That's a miracle. And if somebody does something rotten, well, what do you expect from an orphanage? What do you expect from an orphanage? You know, do you ever wonder why things just seem 
so broken in this world, despite all of our efforts to, to make it right again. We build political systems and religious philosophies and all these things, and yet it doesn't quite work. It's even at our best, you could say, well, that's pretty good for an orphanage. And why do you regularly feel so lonely, so out of place here? Why do you so regularly condemn yourself in your head or condemn other people in your head or out loud? Why does it feel is life on earth feel so beautiful at times and yet ultimately so uneasy? What do you expect from an orphanage? In you know, some orphanage, they orphans they prefer to you know they, they get all this, they feel like they've been abandoned even though they've never felt actually truly at home, and they just kind of hunker down, figuring, well, I'll just kind of be by myself and maybe I can make it all right. Others respond to the sense of being an orphan by uh, bullying other people. They have that same sense of dis-ease, but they work it out on others. And it, furthermore, they decide that it's, it's easier to steal a lunch than buy a lunch. It's easier to, to, to steal money than to make money. They bully other people, taking out their aggressions, trying to get whatever they want in that way. True orphan behavior like that. Uh, other people, other orphans decide, you know, it's all about the toys. We can make life better if we just had the right toys and bigger toys and more expensive toys. And they begin to fight over their toys and hoard their toys and more toys. In fact, they even begin, they, they, they think that's so essential that they even resent those who don't hoard their toys, worrying that they're going to be a burden on them you know, later on. Like, like you're going to need some toys eventually, <laughs> no, but you're not taking mine, right? Other people decide they're going to band together. They could be safer, other orphans, by, by banding with other orphans and fighting against those who may oppose them for other reasons. They, they take over corners of the hallways or areas of the kitchen where they're closest to the food and protect their own shares and so forth. Some orphan bands decide it's actually safer to band together with other orphans and still other gangs, and other gangs, and other gangs, to the point where they, they actually can take over a whole portion of the orphanage grounds, and they'll call it the United States of America, or Mexico, or Canada, or France, or Germany, or China, or North Korea, South Korea, and so we got all kinds of names of bands of orphans, big bands of orphans. And we make all kinds of rules for, for these big bands, assuming that if we could all just agree on the ground rules, it will all be okay, we'll all be uniform, it'll all be all right, until it isn't. And then we finally decide, well, it's not all right in our whole country, our whole big gang, so we're going to go back to our little gangs, and we're going to, to uh, create rules for ourselves, and loyalty oaths, and vows like we just took here uh, this morning, agreeing at least with each other, if we all will agree on this thing, then we can, we can hold our own against those others, we can own our little piece of the hallway. Some of those gangs call themselves Alcoholics Anonymous, others call themselves Microsoft, others call themselves Congregational, others call themselves the Teamsters Union, others call themselves Countryside Community United Church of Christ. We're all these little gangs of orphans. But 2,000 years ago, a misfit was born into the orphanage. Somebody who was pretty strange because while he was born into the orphanage, he claimed he wasn't an orphan. He claimed that he was already has been adopted by his true parent. And because of this sense of identity, he refused to, stand, to, to be bullied, and he also refused to bully others. And these games that people played for power had no interest to him. This whole way that the, all the orphans were trying to climb the social hierarchical ladder or the political ladder or the, the religious ladder, it had no interest to him. It's as if he thought that the, the highest on our ladder was actually far lower than the lowest where he was going. Like the highest on that level was, well, pretty good for an orphanage. And he bore a message to his fellow or the other orphans. 
he bear, bore a message that's really the only message that, it, that, uh, that is truly hopeful for an orphan. He said, you are about to be adopted. You are about to be adopted by a generous father. A generous father who has more than enough to share with others. A generous father who will reward those with, that they have suffered with ease. A generous father who will work with us to, to work out all this hate and enmity, this sense of alienation and so forth, so that we become closer and closer to this father. Now, you may be thinking a couple of things by this point. First of all, um, if we're going to be adopted by a father, does that mean we're going to spend an eternity as a motherless child? I mean, where's the mother in all this, right? Well, bear in mind that Jesus is speaking orphanage language, right? So he may as well have said, you are about to be adopted by your divine mother. But you see how you just cringe when I said divine mother, like, oh, that's not appropriate, right? Proof we're still in an orphanage. <laughs> Jesus knew that God is beyond father and mother. God is both. But as orphans, that kind of explodes our brain. The second thing you may be thinking is we're going to be adopted and everybody's in then why would we bother trying to make this world a better place? I mean, this is an orphanage, right? Why put an ounce of effort into this place if we're going to go to our true home? Well, that's well and good, and that might even be a persuasive argument had it not been for all the people who believed Jesus' message and beginning to act according to it. Those people weren't passive. They weren't waiting for some blessed by and by at all. Those people knew they were not truly orphans, that they were about to be adopted. Therefore, they would not allow people to treat them like orphans. Furthermore, they refused to treat other people like they were orphans because they knew that other people were their brothers and sisters and Jesus was their brother. So therefore, they were sons and daughters of God. Therefore, they refused to be bullied. They refused to bully others. They refused to uh, take on an identity that was too small for them. They refused to hoard their toys, but rather shared them. And they certainly refused to band together to fight against all the other orphans. But rather, they saw that there was nothing in this world that was truly worth killing the soul over. No, Jesus' disciples became very happy people and very active people, realizing that we may all live in an orphanage, but is the orphanage life right now any better if we just safely say, ah, oh, to hell with it, right? Oh, we don't need to worry about making this place a better place. Let's just let the gangs take over, right? Not in the slightest. And of course, all those leaders of the gangs, all those people who had worked their way into the top of the social hierarchy, all those people who had the best toys, guess what they thought about Jesus' message that none of that mattered? You know, they're the ones who opposed Jesus the highest. They had the most to lose in their opinion because they were the kings and queens of the orphanage. Yeah. And so Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, deciding that this is the time to create the uprising at the orphanage. He cast a message that was so blatant that nobody could ever forget it, that was so extravagant and so shocking that no one could ever unsee what they saw on that cross where they put him was his most central statement about loving our enemies, doing good to those who hate us, blessing those who persecute us, praying for those who abuse us. Jesus took that all upon himself, and as the Passover lamb showed, that this God is our parent of all people, including the very ones who put him on the cross. Jesus' disciples knew in the resurrection that everything he had lived and died for was really true. So coming off of Easter, if they had any doubts before, if they had no doubts afterwards, they got happy. They got very, very happy. They started to claim their identity as children of God, as sisters and brothers of Jesus, as sons and daughters, 
who would inherit what Jesus inherited. And they started treating other people like this was in their future too. So that became part of their present reality, not merely a future one. And by spreading this message to all those who felt lonely, all those who felt like they needed to get bullied if they were going to get by in this world or become a bully in order to get by this world, they spread that message to them as well, starting not only the uprising in the orphanage, but turning it into a revolution in the orphanage. So this Easter Sunday, we are met with a central question if we want to celebrate the resurrection. That is, Will we join this revolution, recommit ourselves to this revolution, claiming our identity as sons and daughters of God and and sharing that message to other people who do not feel that way, who are far from that message? Will we join the revolution? Will we recommit ourselves to the revolution? Or will we simply go home, eat ham, and wait till next year to celebrate Easter again? Amen.